A couple of years ago, I worked with Dr. Randall Kurtz to republish his acclaimed book, The Basis Guide to Injury Management, Prevention and Better Health. And we followed that up with a second volume in the same series. You can get both of these books from the Baseline Publishing website and, of course, on Amazon as well. And I'll put links to those in the description below. Now, these books are an absolute goldmine for anyone who is suffering from or who is interested in learning about the typical bass playing related injuries that we're all susceptible to, things like carpal tunnel syndrome and tendonitis, just to name a couple. Randy's worked with many of the biggest names in the business, and in these books you're going to find interviews with people like Victor Wooten, Steve Bailey, John Patitucci, Chuck Rainey, Esperanza Spaulding, and many more. So I thought it'd be a good idea to catch up with Randy and talk about some of the most common injuries that he sees in bass players and hopefully what we can do to avoid them. So I hope you enjoy this, my interview with Dr. Randall Kurtz. Okay, okay. Um, so, um, so for those of you who are watching on Facebook or YouTube or wherever this might end up, please welcome my guest for today, Dr. Randall Kurtz. Thanks for joining us. Stuart, very happy to be here. Thanks for having me today. Oh, it's a pleasure. So, um, so Randy is um, obviously best known for uh, these books, The Bassist's Guide to, let's get the title right here, Injury Management, Prevention and Better Health. And just to give everyone some background, um, Randy and I have known each other for a few years now. Um, I was stocking these books, wasn't I, or the first book at least, on the Baseline website for a, for a couple of years, wasn't I? Yes, and, um, and then you very kindly got in touch with me a couple of years ago when I was on Facebook complaining about my <laughs> frozen shoulder. <laughs> and, yeah, you uh, looked like you needed some help. <laughs> yeah, I, I certainly did. Yeah, and, and uh, that uh, yeah, you were a massive help. Yeah, so that was fantastic. And since then, um, Randy and I have uh, we've done a deal where I'm now the publisher of, of these two books and the, the second one, of course, which was that last year that came out. Yeah, I believe so. Oh, Something yeah. like that. I heard that uh, time seems to have stood still the last year or two, but I was going to say, I'm pretty sure it was around this time last year, and uh, we started uh, putting it out, and and uh, so far so good, I'd say. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, like you say, time's gone a bit weird. It feels like it it was one year, but some part of me thinks was it one year, two years? <laughs> it's it's hard to tell at yeah. this point. Yeah. It's let's. Let's focus on the future, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So look, I think the first thing to ask really is, what is the most common complaint that you see from bass players? Uh, most common complaint or group of complaints is repetitive stress injury, which includes uh, carpal tunnel, shoulder injuries, uh, that kind of thing. What you see more in basis particularly, uh, even more than carpal tunnel, is called ulnar tunnel. And that has to do with the fourth and fifth fingers rather than carpal tunnel, which is generally, or well, not generally, uh, clinically and anatomically, the thumb, uh, index finger, middle finger, and sometimes half of the ring finger. Uh, okay. This is usually because bassists tend to use uh, a lot of angles when they're playing, not only the sort of classic one of bending their wrist forward, which can mm. cause the carpal tunnel stuff, but bassists will also angle to the side when playing, particularly if the, the neck's up here and they root, maybe they put their thumb on the pickup or however it may be, but they tend to kind of also give it one of these then uh, with both electric and upright. And that is usually gonna be the cause of the ulnar tunnel and uh, many times miss or not diagnosed. So you, uh, you must cringe when you see the bass players that have their instruments fairly high up because that does tend to force this wrist into quite a steep angle, doesn't it? It, it, it absolutely does, and, and I find myself doing it myself, so I get it. Uh, we want to be comfortable. We're usually playing long lines of the same thing, uh, aside from, from our base heroes that we, we see a lot of. Uh, and even there, you want to get comfortable, and so one tends to rest their forearm on the instrument, or sometimes, again, uh, either uh, bend the wrist this way and this way, or many times it's going to be both. They're going to rest the forearm, and then he, usually the, the typical thing is to put the thumb on the pickup 
and then you've got sort of a double uh, a double problem happening because not only will that uh, interfere with wrist and hand things, but also can go back to shoulder problems. Uh, tennis and golf are elbow coming from the elbow, so uh, a lot of things happen there. But I'd have to say that's that's probably number one, just because we see our heroes play like that and they don't seem to have any problems. Uh, what we don't see is the uh, what they do when they're not playing. They may hang their hands to their side, they may shake it out. The, bay, the forearm may actually be at kind of an angle when it appears to be flat on the side of the instrument, uh, things like that. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot that goes into, into that, but that's probably the number one uh, thing that I see. You, you, make, you make such an interesting point there, it's something I've never really thought about, but the, the very nature of what we do as bass players, as you say, is, is repetitive, isn't it? We do we do so much where we play the same thing over and over again. I, I've not really considered that, but that must be a huge factor in this. Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, as the name would imply, repetitive motion. I mean, think about it. You're going to, whether you're plucking or picking, uh, you're going to perform thousands of motions uh, in, a, in a pretty short period of time, uh, let's say an average gig is 45 minutes, you're going to have many thousands of motions in that time utilizing the same muscles. And what happens is that builds up over time and causes uh, continual problems there. Uh, many times players will ignore it and keep going uh, and or they'll just keep doing the same thing over and over again. And if the muscles uh, start to fatigue, other muscles will pitch in and then you end up with multiple issues. And, and that's usually when one is forced to uh, seek help or uh, stop playing for a while um, in order to uh, to let everything calm down and uh, sort of remedy the situation. Going back to the um, the angle of, of the hand, obviously that that creates problems. It's, if I'm right in saying this, it, it's the um, the tendons coming through a gap in the wrist, isn't it? And they're being compressed. Is that correct? Well, yeah, what happens is when you bend your wrist like that, you are not only straining uh, the uh, muscles in the wrist and in the hand, but also in the forearm. Uh, tendons uh, connect, which is that that's a tendon right there, that ropey thing, connects muscle. So it goes over to the muscle here to bone, and that's like the bone in the wrist. And again, when you go like this and bend your wrist at that angle, you have many different structures, tendons, blood vessels, et cetera, going through a very narrow place, which is the tunnel that they speak about in carpal tunnel. And they are not only, again, uh, have a lot of structures in a small area, but then yes, you compress that and add the motions to it, they become inflamed, pain ensues. So what are the what are the sort of um, what are the symptoms of this this number one thing that bass players find? What would what would someone notice if they were suffering from this? Well, carpal tunnel. What you're going to notice is again carpal tunnel defined is the thumb, index, middle, and sometimes half of the ring finger. It can be any part of that, but it's usually going to be most or all of that. Uh, a lot of times, not the ring finger, but these for sure, uh, you're going to notice pain, weakness, numbness, uh, usually on the palm side of the hand going in there. Uh, ulnar tunnel will be the fourth and the fifth fingers. So uh, if one goes to a health professional and they say, I think you have carpal tunnel and it's the fourth or the fifth finger, uh, that's incorrect. Absolutely. Again, carpal tunnel can include half of the fourth finger, but if it's the fourth and the fifth, and it always is with that ulnar tunnel, you're going to get that fifth finger in there. Uh, that's something that uh, you're going to see, and that's the most common uh, presentation. A lot of times also, and this is what actually started me on this journey, uh, is as I was going to uh, school, learning these, these things, uh, I also was playing a lot, and I was playing in a haphazard way, and I was getting pain right here 
on the back of my hand, which is this part here. And I was getting pain right here and it was really bothering me a lot. And I didn't have any of those other symptoms, but because I was studying this in real time, I said, oh, I know, I know what that is. And that turns out to be the bones of the hand called carpal bones. Um, they all in, are supposed to articulate individually, much like the fingers do, but because we do a lot of things with our hands and especially in a plane situation, especially with the hand bent like that, these bones all tend to kind of cram together and move as one, especially again with the muscles that attach to them and the tendons being tight and you get pain there. And then what you need is to get these bones moving properly again. Okay, and so without wanting to um, to worry anyone that's that's watching, what's the what kind of recovery time are we looking looking at for an injury of this nature? Well, if you catch it early and take proper steps, meaning find out what the problem is and find out how to deal with it, uh, generally you'll have good success and you'll learn how to deal with it going forth. Meaning uh, if you start to have this pain for a couple of few days, rather than after six, eight months or years even perhaps, uh, and, and find someone that can help you to deal with it, then you're gonna have a lot better chance of success. Uh, also altering your habits uh, at that time it is always the best, although down the road uh, is, is many of the, the patients that I see certainly, but uh, learning how to stretch properly, learning how to take breaks properly, learning how to relax, learning how to alter your technique so you're not bending like that. Uh, these are things that, uh, that will, will help and the sooner the better. And there's, there's a lot of that in the book, isn't there? A lot of um, advice on stretches and um, things that you can do. Yeah, everything, everything is in that book and those books. Part two uh, builds on part one. So while you can get plenty out of part two, part one is really the, uh, the, the starting point for all of this. And everything you need to know is really in that uh, because it tells you what the problems are, tells you how to deal with them. Uh, and that may mean go to this practitioner, go to this practitioner, get this test taken, stop doing this, take a break, whatever it may be. Uh, the most common things and uh, some that aren't so common are all dealt with. And uh, again, it, it tells you uh, how to go forth or how to deal with what you have or how to avoid, most importantly, uh, these kinds of issues. Okay. And I assume there's an element of um, uh, age being related to some of these injuries, because I guess uh, if, for me, I, I'd been playing for 30 years before I had any kind of problem. Um, and I just wonder if there's an accumulation of what you've done over the years that kind of builds builds into these things a little bit. Uh, well, age also goes with uh, changes in the body, obviously, but more importantly, it's going to be how long you've been playing and, and how you play. If you've yeah. been playing for 30 years for a half an hour a day, you're probably not as likely to have these types of issues. If you've been playing a, as a professional musician and gigging and uh, rehearsing and practicing uh, as you would have to in that role, then you're more likely to have these problems and also more likely to have had them in the past and gotten to a certain point where you could no longer ignore them or they no longer went away or, the, or you just couldn't ice it or you just couldn't stretch it or deal with it in that way anymore. So the age thing, uh, yeah, there are certain, certain body changes, of course, that go along with that, but it really depends on how you've been uh playing and and how much over and and for how long yeah sure sure and what's what's the best route for diagnosing one of these things presumably if someone has a problem they're initially going to go and see their doctor but that's not always the um maybe not always the first place to go maybe a physio or something yeah physio is a good choice um my uh my best advice whenever seeking uh, seeking some help, uh, whether from an MD or a physio or a physical therapist or a massage therapist, is bring your instrument 
uh, to the practitioner and let them see what you do. That's how they're best able to help you. Now, this isn't going to fly in a lot of offices. They don't want you bringing in perhaps a double bass. You don't have to bring an amplifier if you're bringing your bass in, but any practitioner who can't spend five minutes watching what you do, and they don't have to know how to play an instrument, they just have to know how to look at you and say, hey, this person's bending their wrist too much. Hey, drop your shoulder a little bit. Or, hey, can you do this? Can you drop your shoulder a little bit? And the player uh, frequently doesn't want to make changes, of course, because they, they're they in their routine that they think is, is uh, works for them. But traditionally and generally, the changes that one is going to have to make are so slight, the only thing they notice is that they feel better when performing these changes. So I always advocate for bringing your instrument to the office. And anybody that says no, I would find somebody that says yes. And, I, and uh, I've had many players in the UK go to many fine uh, practitioners in the NHS. So they're out there. Uh, no matter where you happen to be in the world, you'll find somebody who, if even if they're not a music player or enthusiast, at least cares enough to allow you to uh, to show them what you do so you can get them better. And again, if they don't, I would go elsewhere. Sure. Um, you, you mentioned something interesting a moment ago about taking a, an upright bass in, into the doctors. And I'm conscious that everything that we've talked about so far, right, certainly in my mind, has been geared towards the electric bass. But what, what's the, what's, what kind of things might you encounter as an upright player? Because presumably you're not going to have that harsh angle over the edge of the instrument problem that the electric players have. Yes, but but uh, you'll have a lot of similar issues. The main difference is going to be with upright players. It's usually shoulder, uh, and it's going to be shoulder. Uh, let, let's assume the player is right-handed or plays in a right-handed fashion. A lot of times the shoulder is going to be elevated and high, and there's going to be problems there. With the right hand, it's going to be a lot of times with bowing. Uh, there's, there's particular challenges with bowing both the French and German bow that, um, uh, and, and also the sort of pedagogy that goes along with learning that instrument is usually uh, a classroom or an orchestral uh, or a pretty uh, serious lesson type of situation. And uh, a lot of times there is not the, the education to, hey, drop your shoulder, hey, move your wrist. Uh, that kind of thing. So those are the problems that I will generally see uh, in those situations, but they also having the base at an angle to your body, uh, that's going to affect your wrist angles uh, as well in, in both situations. Um, but again, it, it's just, it, it really deals down, uh, excuse me, it really goes, gets down to seeing what one is doing and making slight changes. And, uh, and, and, and you're usually able to help out with that. I see a lot of uh, upright bassists that, uh, again, small changes, uh, big gains. Okay. Now, in, in prepping for this uh, interview, I was looking through the two books and, um, I, I guess I'm more familiar with the first book than the, the second, really. I was looking through the second one, and there's some uh, some ailments in here that they uh, they sound really quite unusual. You've got things like um, Dequavane syndrome and uh, De Poyton's contracture, things like this. They're not not so well known, are they, as as the big two, tendonitis mm -hmm. and carpal tunnel. No, they're not, but but also uh, very important. I am seeing a lot of players, especially upright players, in the past year with thumb issues. Okay. Uh, and the thumb is probably maybe the least understood amongst practitioners about how to deal with it. Uh, because there's a few different motions that it makes, and it's easy enough to say, oh, it's arthritis, or it's this, or it's something else. 
but there are a couple situations where there are particular issues with the thumb and again one can just change uh, the way they play uh, just a little bit so as they wouldn't even notice again except for the relief uh, and the Dupuytren's contracture that's something that um, is when you got it you you have to uh, unlike a lot of these other issues you have to really alter the way you play because there's not a lot you can do about it uh, any of these other conditions there's there's sort of uh, tiers of, of how to deal with it very conservatively just do some stretching just do some muscle work or go and get some uh, some uh, chiropractic work or some physical therapy work or some acupuncture and then you get into injections for pain relief and for muscle relaxation and then finally surgery uh, with the Dupuytrens, all it is is it's a well not all it is it's it's a serious matter but it's a puckering up of the skin and the muscle in the hand so it kind of looks like that if you're able to see but it stays like that all the time and it usually gets worse that results in the muscles uh shortening and the hand kind of getting a little tighter i've seen it mostly in drummers but i have seen it in a in basis and when they come to me with that i tell them there's really nothing that I can do for you, nor anybody. Um, surgery uh, has been helpful uh, for some, uh, but certainly not all. And uh, if you don't want surgery, it's uh, if you don't want to take that chance, it, it's it's a tough one. Sure. Yeah. It sounds uh, sounds terrifying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it is. It's it's not one of the ones you want. <laughs> no, no, for sure. So um, you're, you're best known to, um, I guess, most people as um, someone that deals with these issues in bass players. And obviously your, your books um, have been geared towards bass players. But um, I know in the in the past year, you started to release books geared towards other instrumentalists, some of you um, piano players and drummers and string players. Can you tell us about that? Uh, yes, I, I have. Um, the issues that a musician is going to face uh, a lot of them are going to be similar. The problems a musician is going to face, a lot of them are going to be similar. Uh, it really boils down to how you're going to uh, uh, manage your relationship with your instrument and how your technique is going to be. And again, awareness, uh, taking breaks, bending the wrist, uh, et cetera, et cetera. There's going to be times when every musician is going to have to uh, make a motion or exercise or do uh, something that is not necessarily structurally good for them. But it's about of making them aware of the fact that you don't always have to stay that way, okay? For example, simply, I might have my bass on and I might sort of bend forward when I'm reading music and I might do this for decades. Like a lot of our favorite studio musicians, if you see them in person uh, or again, uh, sort of analyze them as I do, um, you, their backs are way curved and their heads are really curved forward. Um, awareness of this situation early on when you're still able to sort of remedy basic posture rather than when it becomes too late and it becomes part of you, that's really key to, uh, to avoiding a lot of these issues. Uh, so again, a lot of the basic premises are the same, but I'm also able to break down technique, anatomy, and uh, uh, pedagogy of, of other instruments and uh, drummers, guitarists. Uh, there's separate books for all of these. There's one for the piano coming along. And um, the, again, to be able to point out these things, make one aware, basic postural consider and technique considerations. And uh, that's what I've done and uh, seems to be going well. <laughs> Fantastic. So it's yeah. not just bass players that suffer. <laughs> <laughs> well, bass players suffer for a lot of reasons, I think, Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what's your, um, do you do you personally see um, more bass players than other instrumentalists in your own practice, or is it is it a mix of everything? I see more bass players uh, mostly because I'm known for it. Yeah. Uh, people seek me out because of um, 
because they see the videos that I've done, um, because they've heard of me, because they have the book, uh, because another musician has recommended uh, me to them. Uh, so I'm known, and, and I play bass, so I'm known in that community. Uh, and in other musicians' uh, communities, I'm known and becoming more known, but I'm not as entrenched as bassists. So yeah, it's mostly bassists. Sure, you, you mentioned something that obviously um, most people will know is the fact that you play bass yourself. Um, yes. Have you have you encountered any of these um, uh, problems yourself in your own playing? Sure. Uh, again, the thing that got me started doing all this is uh, when I was playing and when I was going to school at the same time, I noticed myself having certain problems. Uh, and I knew how to sort of avoid them. And I, I wrote them down and I started collecting them and uh, um, started writing about them. And that's where all this came from. Uh, then I asked a lot of my friends in the uh, in the industry and other bass players, hey, does this happen to you? What what do you do for this? What what uh, what is the situation here? What is the most common thing that you may encounter? And uh, and I got their feedback and, and started putting it all together properly. Um, the main thing that I would stress to anybody in injury prevention is awareness. Uh, it's hey, my, my hand hurts, uh, and, and not just my hand hurts and it's been hurting for a long time, but hey, my hand is starting to hurt, and I noticed that when I angle it this way, it feels better, and I remember that guy said I should do this, so I'm going to do this, and then you get to a, uh, a place where not only are you aware and able to make corrections either right from the get-go or on the fly as you're playing, but also you're able to avoid these things because you remember to do things like drop your shoulders and take a breath or keep your hands or shake out your wrists or, or something of that nature. So that that's really how that all works best. But you don't know there's a problem until you know what it is. So sure. so that's that's what I think my role is to bring awareness to the musician, to the bassist and uh, and bring that into their life so that they're uh, they're able to avoid these problems by and large going forward. So you're uh, you're obviously well known amongst the the bass community, and as you said, you're gradually sort of working your way out to um, to drummers and string players. Um, I just wonder what's next for you. Uh, I, you know, I <laughs> you, I kind of like my life the way it is. Uh, just just keep on trucking. Um, I uh, I've got. Uh, again, the last couple of books in my sort of education series are the uh, the pianist book, which I'm um, finishing up soon. I've got one for uh, brass and wind players coming out, and then I'm working on a on an education project, a larger project to bring this type of education into the classroom. Um, I do a lot of consulting on these matters. I do lectures uh, at universities or at music schools or whoever whoever wants me, uh, frankly. Uh, but I'm I'm developing a component of injury prevention that is very basic that can be inserted into anything from the very beginning of music education, young kids to university level. And uh, and that that's that's my current uh, my current project, and um, I'm well into it, and and looking forward to getting that out uh, uh, in the future, and and continuing to uh, to do what I do to uh, to to lecture, to write, to present uh, on all this stuff because I I love it, and and it, and it works um, happily. Well, it's 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 fantastic to have you as part of the bass community. I mean, you've you've helped me, and you've helped countless other other people as as well. So um, yeah, look forward to seeing what happens next. Okay, uh, Randy, thanks very much for your time today. It's been absolutely fantastic to talk to you. It's been great to talk to you, Stuart. And let me add just another thing that I want to continue is to develop uh, ergonomic products for the music industry. Uh, I've been working on uh, and developed, I've developed straps for John Patitucci. I've developed, uh, and along with 
John Petitucci and the Groove Gear Company uh, and done some other straps there and, and other products uh, aimed at, uh, at helping musicians out. So that's, that's part of what I wish to continue to do as well. Okay, fantastic. Where, where would we, we find the, uh, the John Patitucci strap if we wanted to check that out? Uh, you can find that at my, a link at my website, uh, www.drkertz.com. The company that manufactures it is Groove Gear, uh, G-R-U-V-G-E-A-R. Uh, a lot of leading retailers uh, carry this, but one of those places would be uh, the good place to start. And I have a YouTube channel, uh, which is linked from my site, which has hundreds of of videos uh in in the vein of the things we've been talking about fantastic okay we'll make sure we get all those uh, all those links in the description below awesome. okay thanks randy Stuart. thanks again i appreciate the time and uh and the consideration appreciate you very right, welcome good to see you good to see you buddy thanks for watching my interview with dr randall kurtz if you're interested in checking out either of randy's books you'll find links in the description below okay thanks again guys see you soon